Welcome to Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear a book by the author, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be talking about the later life of Charles Dickens. On 9th June 1865, while returning from Paris with Ellen Ternan, Dickens was involved in the Stablehurst rail crash in Kent, The train's first seven carriages plunged off a cast-iron bridge that was under repair. The only first-class carriage to remain on the track was the one in which Dickens was traveling. Before rescuers arrived, Dickens tended and comforted the wounded and the dying with a flask of brandy and a hat refreshed with water, and saved some lives. Before leaving, he remembered the unfinished manuscript for our mutual friend, and he returned to his carriage to retrieve it. Dickens later used the experience of the crash as material for his short ghost story, The Signal Man, in which the central character has a premonition of his own death in a rail crash. He also based the story on several previous rail accidents, such as the Clayton Tunnel rail crash in Sussex of 1861. Dickens managed to avoid an appearance at the inquest to avoid disclosing that he had been traveling with Ternan and her mother, which would have caused a scandal. After the crash, Dickens was nervous when traveling by train and would use alternative means when available. In 1868, he wrote, I have sudden vague rushes of terror even when riding in a hansom cab, which are perfectly unreasonable but quite insurmountable. Dickens' son Henry recalled, I've seen him sometimes in a railway carriage when there was a slight jolt. When this happened, he was almost in a state of panic and gripped the seat with both hands. Second Visit to the United States While he contemplated a second visit to the United States, the outbreak of the Civil War in America in 1861 delayed his plans. On 9 November 1867, over two years after the war, Dickens set sail from Liverpool for his second American reading tour. Landing in Boston, he devoted the rest of the month to a round of dinners with such notables as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and his American publisher, James T. Fields. In early December, the readings began. He performed 76 readings, netting 19,000 pounds from December 1867 to April 1868. Dickens shuttled between Boston and New York, where he gave 22 readings at Steinway Hall. Although he had started to suffer from what he called the true American Cathar, he kept to a schedule that would have challenged a much younger man— even managing to squeeze in some slang in Central Park. During his travels, he saw a change in the people and the circumstances of America. His final appearance was at a banquet the American press held in his honor at Delmonico's on 18 April, when he promised never to denounce America again. By the end of the tour, Dickens could hardly manage solid food, subsisting on champagne and eggs beaten in sherry. On 23 April, he boarded the Cunard liner Russia to return to Britain, barely escaping a federal tax lien against the proceeds of his lecture tour. Farewell Readings In 1868-69, to Dickens gave a series of farewell readings in England, Scotland, and Ireland, beginning on 6 October. He managed, of a contracted 100 readings, to give 75 in the provinces, with a further 12 in London— As he had pressed on, he was affected by giddiness and fits of paralysis. He had a stroke on 18 April 1869 in Chester. He collapsed on 22 April 1869 at Preston, Lancashire. On doctor's advice, the tour was canceled. After further provincial readings were canceled, he began work on his final novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. 
It was fashionable in the 1860s to do the slums, and in company, Dickens visited opium dens in Shadwell, where he witnessed an elderly addict called Lascar Sal, who formed the model for Opium Sal in Edwin Drood. After Dickens regained enough strength, he arranged, with medical approval for a final series of readings, to partly make up to his sponsors what they had lost due to his illness. There were 12 performances. On 11 January to 15 March 1870, the last at 8 o'clock p.m. at St. James's Hall, London. Though in grave health by then, he read A Christmas Carol and The Trial from Pickwick. On 2 May, he made his last appearance at a Royal Academy banquet in the presence of the Prince and Princess of Wales, paying a special tribute on the death of his friend, illustrator Daniel MacLeese. On 8 June 1870, Dickens had another stroke at his home after a full day's work on Edwin Drood. He never regained consciousness. And the next day, he died at Gads Hill Place. Biographer Claire Tomlin has suggested Dickens was actually in Peckham when he had had the stroke, and his mistress Ellen Turnan and her maids had him taken back to Gads Hill so that the public would not know the truth about their relationship. Contrary to his wish to be buried at Rochester Cathedral, in an inexpensive, unostentatious, and strictly private manner, he was laid to rest in the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey. A printed epitaph circulated at the time of the funeral reads, To the memory of Charles Dickens, England's most popular author who died at his residence, Hyam, near Rochester, Kent, 9 June 1870, aged 58 years. He was a sympathizer with the poor, the suffering, and the oppressed. And by his death, one of England's greatest writers is lost to the world. A letter from Dickens to the clerk of the Privy Council in March indicates he'd been offered and had accepted a baronet's to see, which was not gazettized before his death. His last words were on the ground in response to his sister-in-law Georgina's request that he lie down. On Sunday, 19 June 1870... Five days after Dickens was buried in the Abbey, Dean Arthur Penryn Stanley delivered a memorial elegy, lauding the genial and loving humorist whom we now mourn, for showing by his own example that even in dealing with the darkest scenes and the most degraded characters, genius could still be clean and mirth could be innocent. Pointing to the fresh flowers that adorned the novelist's grave, Stanley assured those present that the spot would thenceforth be a sacred one with both the new world and the old, as that of the representative of literature, not of this island only, but of all who speak our English tongue. In his will, drafted more than a year before his death, Dickens left the care of his 80,000-pound estate to his longtime colleague John Forster, and his best and truest friend— Georgina Hogarth, who along with Dickens's two sons, also received a tax-free sum of £8,000. Although Dickens and his wife had been separated for several years at the time of his death, he provided her with an annual income of £600 and made her similar allowances in his will. He also bequeathed £1919 to each servant in his employment at the time of his death. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today. While we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite classic authors. Again, my name is Brie Carlyle, and I hope you come back next time when we answer more questions about one of your favorite classic authors. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the links for our show.